So we have talked about immigrants and urban challenges, as well as American art so far in this chapter. Today, we are going to be looking at how American society is going to be reformed. Your learning objective for today is to study the lives of African Americans who founded schools and advanced their rights in communities, and to trace the development of the American education system from its earliest roots. One of the first things this section goes over is the Second Great Awakening. This is a period of re religious evangelism that began in the 1790s and became widespread in the U.S. by the 1830s. During this time, there is a new interest in religion that is spreading across the country. Charles Finney is going to become one of the most important leaders of the Second Great Awakening. He believed that each individual was responsible for his or her own salvation, and he would hold prayer meetings that lasted for days. This new style of preaching would anger some traditional ministers, such as Lyman Beecher. Beecher wanted to prevent Finney from holding any revivals in his city, but could not do so because the First Amendment protected Finney's rights to religious freedom. This is an important event in American history because it is going to lead to church membership growing across the United States. And this new religious faith is going to often lead to involvement in movements who reform society, which is what we're going to be discussing now. Members of the growing middle class, especially women, are in many cases going to lead efforts to tackle issues such as alcohol abuse, prison and education reform, and slavery. One of the issues that many social reformers are going to try and change is alcohol abuse. Many believe that Americans drank too much and that this led to social problems such as family violence, poverty, and criminal behavior, and as a result, the temperance movement is going to take place. The temperance movement was a social reform effort that began in the mid-1800s to encourage people to drink less alcohol. They urged people to use self-discipline to stop drinking, and groups like the American Temperance Society and the American Temperance Union helped to spread this message. The next issue social reformers are going to tackle is prison reform. One problem with the prison system during this time is that it often jailed the mentally ill with criminals. Dorothea Dix visited prisons throughout Massachusetts during this time and reported what she had seen to the state legislature. She had reported that the mentally ill were often left in dark cells without clothes or heat, and were chained to the walls and beaten. Her work would have a nationwide effect, and as a result, facilities for the mentally ill would be built across the nation. Another issue the prison system had was that it held runaway children and orphans. These children had survived by begging or stealing, and they often received the same punishment as an adult. Josiah Quincy, who was the Boston mayor, would ask that these young offenders receive a different punishment than that of the adults. As a result, reformed schools for children would be founded. Here, children still lived under strict rules, but they also gained the opportunity to learn useful skills. So we've talked about how many reformers thought it was important to change alcohol abuse in the prison system. Now let's talk about how many wanted to reform the education system. The availability of education varied widely during the 1800s. Many schoolhouses were small, and children of all ages and levels worked in the same room. Imagine today if in your classroom there wasn't only 8th graders, but you had 1st graders, 4th graders, 11th graders, etc. Imagine how different education for you would be. Another issue during this time was that few teachers were trained and girls were usually kept at home instead of receiving an education. Your social background and wealth also usually determined the quality of education that you would receive. This is all going to lead to the common school movement. Led by Horace Mann, this movement promoted the idea of having all children educated in a common place regardless of their social class or background. The reasoning behind this idea was that reformers thought education made children responsible citizens and that would benefit the community as a whole. 
Mann convinced the state of Massachusetts to double its school budget and raise teacher salaries. He also lengthened the school year and began the first school for teacher, teacher training. His success would set a standard for education reform throughout the entire country. Education reform would also create greater opportunities for women and those with special needs. Catherine Beecher would start an all-female academy in Hartford, Connecticut, and Gridley Howe would open the Perkins School for the Blind, and Thomas Gallaudet would find the first free American school for the hearing impaired. Now that we've talked about different reform movements, let's take a look at the African Americans who founded schools and advanced their rights and communities. Free African Americans usually lived in segregated or separate communities in the North, and these communities were often influenced by the Second Great Awakening and its spirit of reform. Founded by former slave Richard Allen, the Free African Religious Society became a model for other groups that pressed for racial equality and the education of blacks. Other influential African Americans of the time, such as Alexander Carmel, pushed for the creation of schools for black Americans. African Americans still would rarely attend college because few would accept them. Even though they enjoyed some opportunities to attend school in the North and Midwest, few had this chance in the South. This is because slaveholders feared that education and knowledge would lead to a revolt among enslaved African Americans. Now at the beginning of this lesson we had a learning objective which was to study the lives of African Americans who founded schools and advanced their rights and communities and to also trace the development of the American education system from its earliest roots. I would like you to reflect on this lecture to see if you reached this objective and if not to go back and listen again or refer to your textbook in chapter 13 section 3. Please also keep an eye on Google Classroom for any follow-up questions I may have. Thanks for listening and have a great day.